Good morning. I'm going to kick off. I think most people are here. There might be a couple of people outside, but I think this is a good time to start. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us here at BFI South Bank for the Create Interruptions Festival of Arts and Activism. What I want to do in this short welcome is say a little bit about how the festival fits in with a wider project called Creative Interruptions. You've seen the logo kind of branded on everything today. And I then just want to cover a few logistical points that you need to be aware of over the next couple of days before introducing our opening keynote address. I'm Sarita Malik, I'm the Principal Investigator of Creative Interruptions. And this idea for the project is something that the team first came up with back in 2014. And what we were interested in doing was looking at the relationship between creative practice and marginalisation of those experiencing a history of exclusion or displacement. An understanding specifically of historical, colonial and imperial practice has been central to what we've been trying to do over the last few years and how their operations have created connections between increasingly disparate and desperate politics on differing kinds of political and cultural margins in the age of hyper-globalisation. Creative Interruptions is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council through its Connected Communities Programme and Brunel University London. And myself and the research team would like to thank um, the HRC for supporting what's actually a very complex uh, and intricate programme of work. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all the fantastic collaborators who've worked with us over the last few years, the community partners, many of whom are here today, and also, of course, I'd like to thank the brilliant co-investigators on the Creative Interruptions project, Ben, Charanji, Anandi, Michael, Finton, Paul, and all of the Brunel team that have worked so hard, not just in pulling together the festival um, that you're here at today, but also on working with the project over the past few years. Specifically, I want to mention Fatini, Daisy, and Iotta. So what this festival allows us to do is to look at some of these issues further and also bring together the perspectives of even more artists, more academics and um, more activists. And we want to ask over the next couple of days, how might new repertoires of um, activisms creatively interrupt, whether in terms of policy, in terms of uh, public understandings or mainstream representations and what might different forms and processes of creativity that are routinely marginalised, not marginal, tell us about ideas of community, ideas of inequality and ideas of creativity, both in past and present circumstances. So what we've been trying to do within the project is really to foreground creative practices that often go unnoticed or actually hidden by uh, the mainstream public agenda and by the creative and cultural industries more widely. On this research journey, we've realised that the specificities of geographical, historical and political contexts across which we're working, specifically the sites that we've been focusing on are mainland UK, Northern Ireland, Palestine and India, that they guarantee no easy theoretical or philosophical solidarity amongst us, even if we share fundamentally the same belief in equality and justice. So despite what connects us, the axis of difference, especially around the ideas of the global south and global north, around race and class, guarantee that when we speak across contexts, we're in danger of simplifying or translating our work in order to engender solidarity. When we speak of communities, communities being marginalised, for example, are we recreating old colonial tactics of reifying binary exclusionary practices? When we talk about social exclusion, for example, from the cultural industries, how can we assume that being part of that mainstream, that so-called centre, is even what those who tend to sit outside of its frame of reference actually even want? What social exclusion, disenfranchisement or the margins looks like then is always contingent. It's always a question of difference and of perspective, as is the question of at what point does creative work become recognised as resistant, political or interruptive? Two years on from the Grenfell fire in which 72 people died, Grenfell survivors and victims last week projected messages on high-rise tower blocks in London, in Manchester and Newcastle. 
They criticise the neglect, ongoing safety failures, lack of accountability and what Gary Ann a couple of days ago called state culpability of Grenfell. An important part of Grenfell United's protest is the creative, affective forms it uses to occupy public spaces and draw the eye, whether in the form of silent walks or digital projections. These are designed to be interruptive and they're deeply political forms of creative resistance that insist on putting Grenfell and its underlying injustices on the agenda. And perhaps there's nowhere better in the UK than London's the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea that exemplifies the, the race and class-based inequalities produced through gentrification, hostile environments and violent corporatisation. The majority of Grenfell residents were Arab, African, Muslim, as well as Black Britons, refugees, European migrants and white English working class. The first Grenfell victim to be named was a Syrian refugee, Mohammed al Hajali. With what Keenan's called a border in every street, the physical walls of post Grenfell are a canvas for local communities, artists and activists to expose the gradual violence of empire. The self-funded mural titled Justice that was soon to be erased was on a wall opposite a school attended by children and families affected by the fire. Small handprints in red paint were pressed alongside the most senior Royal Borough Council officers' salaries and names, evoking the stark polarity between Kensington's rich and poor, even in the form of an unintentionally ephemeral piece of border art. What then can different creative forms actually do and in what ways? Take, for example, the kind of creative sense that can be shared across the creative economies, filmmaking, theatre or literature, for example, compared to, say, everyday practices such as singing, storytelling or working. The motivations also naturally differ. It's not for all about wanting to be assimilated, as I said, into a mainstream cultural centre, that binary logic that still underpins cultural policies based on diversity, which are fixated constantly on boosting the numbers of diverse people without actually recognising the underlying racialized and class-based hierarchies that remain intact within the sector and more widely. Let's maybe flip this centre margin dynamic and hierarchy and problematise some of the creative, um, sorry, corrective intuitions of funded work with so-called disadvantaged, hard to reach communities and ask how the centre can be challenged and learned from the so-called margins and what mainstream creative practice can actually learn from those creative practices that have been marginalised. Visibility also comes at a cost. Specifically, what is the cost of visibility or invisibility in hostile environments? Environments in which anti-immigrant sentiment thrives, Muslims, migrants and asylum seekers have been pathologised and hostile policies shore up these views and seek to administer the supposed problem of difference. The rise of far-right leaders and governments worldwide and the continuing power of neoliberal capitalism have combined, especially since the 2008 global financial crisis, to magnify these pre-existing oppressions and inequalities. How do we discuss the dangers of neoliberalism and commodification, including as threats to creative practice that's formed through imagined solidarities, when the scales of economic inequality vary so enormously across the context that we're looking at? Therefore, you can tell from all of this, we've not been able to base our research on creative interruptions on any sense of easy assumption. The journey of co-production that we've embarked on has sometimes been more, sometimes less successful. We've collected small anecdotal details in conversations and interviews and workshops and co-created activist art together, much of which you can see here at the festival. The research has also involved collaborators in imagining and making and telling as a set of interrelated creative practices in which we've attempted to capture, retrieve and restore new and old stories. Building a co-production of knowledge has in some instances generated really important micro forms of solidarity. We've tried to negotiate the barriers between academic and community whilst working in systems that stubbornly maintain these barriers, particularly administrative. 
This kind of work can also produce huge amounts of tension because academic practices and frameworks purport that particular kinds of authorised knowledge are legitimate. And the methodological tendencies to go out there and mine stories where communities are treated as research objects is of course deeply problematic in all cases, but particularly when we're trying to address questions of inequality. One of the things that post-colonial criticism challenges us to do, and which we found so useful, is to find new ways of producing knowledge. And we've been influenced in particular in our research journey by Sivanandan's work and his concept of lived theory, because it seeks to reorientate research to people's actual experiences and unfolding struggles of equality. All of this suggests a radically different way of thinking about politics, government and social change by looking to practice, in our case, creative practice. So what we want to do at the festival is share some of these findings, have conversations around some of the issues that I've just mentioned and show some of the artwork that we've been collaborating with others to produce and to further interrogate these issues. So we invite you to connect with us here um, during the festival and also through other means, for example, our website. So what I'm going to do now is share some announcements that are quite important points to note uh, over the next couple of days. So you'll have seen from the kind of infrastructure here that what we're doing is filming and photographing the festival um, over the two days. The event is going to be recorded throughout, so if you've got any objections to being photographed or filmed, then do please let us know that you wish to opt out. And you can find details of the team in the programme that you'll have in your amazing tote bags. Um, the QR code and interruptive map is something else that I want to tell you about. We've been creating a map that is a continuous work in progress and it charts the creative interruptions that the projects help to facilitate. Uh, you can access the map by scanning the QR code, which I think is on the back of the program. Alternatively, you can visit creativeinterruptions.com slash map. And in the spirit of co-creation, we are inviting you to submit documentation of your creative interruptions that challenge exclusion to help to build this map up. And we, we're accepting a range of materials, including photos, videos, illustrations, audio files. You can find more details if you click on the link. Please, can I also encourage you to tweet? Our hashtag is hashtag creative interruptions and hashtag arts and activism. You will find questionnaires in your, in your bags, I think, in your pack. So if you'd be so kind as to complete these and hand them to a member of the team, or there's a box where you can deposit um, those, they'll really help us to find out more about your sense of the festival. And if you have for any reason misplaced the form or need another one, then we can send you an electronic version after the event. Additionally, we are going to approach you in the break times and this evening to try and engage you in conversation and with your consent we'd like to film you just so that we can get some feedback about what's brought you here to the festival and why you're interested in some of the themes. Um, a light lunch will be served on both days and there's a lot to see and get involved in in break times. You'll note that actually the lunch breaks are quite short. Um, in terms of coffees and teas, obviously our location means that we're really spoilt for choice. So if you feel like you need some coffee to keep you going and there is a lot to see and do, then do please feel free to grab a coffee from the cafe downstairs. We would like to encourage you to attend all of our workshops, but two in particular that I want to highlight are the puppets and the probots, because these are ongoing workshops that carry on during the festival. The puppets um, we're going to collectively build um, today, from today, and there'll be a performance at the end of the festival tomorrow. And the probots can be engaged with during the break time and when the blue room is not in use for a panel discussion. So do please um, actively engage with those workshops um, on an ongoing basis. In terms of safety, please take note of the fire exits in the three main spaces where the festival is taking place. That's here in NFT3, the Blue Room, which is just across the way, and the Atrium, which is downstairs. And if there is a, an emergency, a BFI staff member will advise us accordingly. And I think that's everything, but yeah, I think that's everything.